All right, all you beautiful bulletproof handymen and women, let's dive in and talk about what skills are required to be a handyman. If you're here taking this masterclass or watching me on YouTube, then you're either trying to or currently running a handyman business. And we're gonna have a conversation about the skills that are required. So first of all, I wanna make this very, very clear. I'm probably gonna repeat it a few times. You don't have to have all of these skills in order to start and run a handyman business. You should have a lot of them. There are not specific ones that you must have and specific ones that don't matter. What I'm trying to say here is if you have half of these skills, you can quickly learn the other half. If you only have a quarter of these skills, it may take a little more of a learning curve to learn the rest of them. And if you have 75% of these skills, you're basically just about there. But this is a full list of skills. And when I say full, I do not mean exhaustive. I do not mean that there are no other skills you'll need. But this is a full list of the most common skills that you're going to need in order to start and run your handyman business if you're trying to figure out whether or not you are qualified or do have the skills or would be capable of acquiring them. So I'm just gonna start at the top here, guys. And the first list I'm gonna give you is that you'll need to learn to use the following tools. You need to become proficient or at least be able to figure out relatively quickly how to use the following tools. So, number one, a skill saw. The skill saw for me, for the most part, I'm going to be using to cut plywood, which you don't want to do if you need perfect cuts unless you're very experienced, but I'm going to use it to cut plywood and I'm going to use it to cut lumber. That's mostly what I use it for. It will come in handy in many other situations, but it's going to be a skill that you're going to need to have or you're going to need to pick up quickly. Number two, a chop saw. Chop saws are the ones that sit on the tabletop and you just come down like that and you're going to need chop saws for more precise cuts like if you need to cut a very precise 45 degree angle to go around some window trim or maybe you're putting up crown molding or you just need for that cut to be a perfect cut for whatever reason you'll need to own and use a chop saw. You can get away with not having one if you're good with a skill saw though. Number three, and you don't need to use this often and you don't need to start with this, but a table saw. There will be times eventually when you need a table saw. I can honestly say that because I've gotten relatively skilled with my skill saw, which I wasn't when I started, by the way, I wasn't good with skill saws. I was a jigsaw guy when I started this business and I had to learn my skill saw and now I'm good enough at it only from the practice from the business, not because I'm good at it, but because I had no choice but to practice and use it over and over, I can cut almost perfect lines with a skill saw. But when you need to rebuild drawer boxes for kitchen drawers, which is a thing that's going to come up frequently as a handyman, you're going to need a table saw for that purpose to make the types of cuts and rabbits and dados and stuff that you're going to need to make. But like I said, you don't have to start out with that skill and you definitely don't have to start out owning a table saw. It's just going to be something that you're going to need to be able to do eventually. Next is going to be a multi-tool. And if you don't know what a multi-tool is, that's the handheld one that has the blade sticking out the end with the teeth on the end that just goes back and forth really fast like that. Again, uh, I mean, these, these didn't even really exist when I was a young man doing a lot of construction. They didn't even really exist. So it's not a tool you have to have. There are always other tools you can use. But I found that for replacing fascia, which is going to be a very common job on rental homes or on any homes, for replacing fascia and jobs similar to that, it's going to be really handy to have that thin blade that you can squeeze between two boards and cut the nails rather than to have to disassemble the entire edge of the roof. Next is going to be a jigsaw. You don't use jigsaws super often, but when you're cutting holes in countertops, you're going to need a jigsaw so that you can go around and cut curves in things. Also, for example, fences and gates, sometimes they cut little patterns into the top of them, like they put all the pickets on, and then they cut some pretty pattern. You'll need a jigsaw for, to duplicate something like that. Uh, you're going to need a grinder 
or you're going to need to know how to use a grinder and you're going to need to know how to use it safely and the purpose of the grinder for the most part for me is twofold one is cutting metal it's often much quicker if you need to cut some sort of beam or say a rail for some closet doors to just take your grinder and make the cut with a grinder and then also quite a bit more dangerously is when you're working with masonry i found that a nice eight inch diamond blade on a regular cordless grinder is going to cut through stone and other masonry far faster than a lot of other products that are made specifically for that. A uh, router, you're going to need to learn how to use a router. Now there are there are expensive and time-consuming ways to get around needing a router, but the main purpose of the router that I need over and over is when I install interior doors. Every time I do an interior door, I'm buying a slab door that's already got the hole cut in it for where the knob and or deadbolt go and the latches, but where the hinges go, those are not going to be mortised out yet because there's so many different hinge sizes and depths and lengths and distances. So you're going to have to mortise those hinge slots all on your own. And that can be done by hand with a regular router. Like I said, there are more complex, more expensive ways to do it, but at minimum, you eventually will need a router for some hinge slots. Uh, also a reciprocating saw. Most of these are just things that cut things as you can see so far. Reciprocating saw, you don't have to have one, but it's going to come in super handy when you're doing demolition because it makes large rough cuts very quickly and also for trimming trees. Uh, you'll need to learn how to use a belt sander eventually. You may not ever need one, but for example, like nice butcher block tops, you're going to end up needing to sand those every now and then, and you don't want to start with just your random orbital, which is the next tool on the list is a random orbital sander. But both of those types of sanders, it'll be very good for you to have them and learn how to use them. There is some skill involved there, but as I keep saying, it's not a skill that you can't pick up on the job if you generally have a lot of these skills already. Uh, you're going to need to learn... You're going to need a hammer drill and you're going to need to learn how to use it for drilling into masonry and concrete in general. Any, any sort of masonry work where you need to attach, let's say, a post to a block fence so that a gate can close on it. Or over here to actually attach the hinges or to another post, you're going to need to drill into block and you're going to need to drill into cement quite frequently. That is going to require a hammer drill. It is also a skill you can pick up on the spot with just a little bit of research, but that's another skill you'll need. What else are we going to need? Uh, you're going to need to know just generally how to safely use pneumatic nailers and staplers. You're going to eventually need to know how to use a tile saw like a wet saw, unless you just don't do any tile. And yes, you can get away with not doing any tile, but as I said in the previous lesson, you want to be the everything guy. Tile work, at least repairs, is not very hard, so go ahead and just teach yourself how to do that, but know that that'll be a skill that you'll eventually want to get under your belt. You'll want to know how to safely use a chainsaw. That's going to be mostly for taking down dead trees. Um, a multimeter, as a well-rounded handyman, you are going to do some electrical troubleshooting on ceiling fans, on outlets, on lots of electrical items. So you'll need to just teach yourself how to use a multimeter. You don't need to know all the functions, but you need to know how to set it to check voltage and check resistance at the very least. Next, you're going to need, uh, yeah, this is a big one. You're going to need to learn how to sweat copper. That means you're going to need a soldering torch, which is butane or propane or whatever's in there, where you heat up the copper and you use your solder and you solder new copper plumbing together. Most of the houses in the United States are plumbed with copper. Plumbing is going to be a big part of your job. It is eventually going to leak and you are eventually going to need to learn that on the spot. The good news is you can learn it on the spot. You, it'll, you'll have a very ugly, ugly joint, but it doesn't matter if it's ugly. What matters is if it works, and as long as it does work and it doesn't leak, you're going to be okay, but you're definitely going to be needing to learn, preferably beforehand, how to sweat copper. Next, you're going to need drywall tools for patching, and you're going to need to generally know how to use them. Now, this is a very manual skill, where your brain's going to build modules for it over time. The first time you do a drywall patch, I promise you it's going to look horrible. 
The second one's gonna look a little bit less horrible, but still horrible, and you're gonna need to do a handful or a dozen of them before they start looking satisfactory. It's gonna take a lot of practice. If you can practice that before you start your business, that would be very good because everybody expects a handyman to be able to do drywall patches. It's just synonymous with, with the term handyman in general. Uh, you're going to need to know how to work PVC, so you're going to just need to know how the primer and the glues work, how the cutting tools work, and how to fit everything together. That you can definitely figure out on the spot. I learned that, I think I was probably 12 or 13 when I started working with PVC with my stepdad, and it did not take long to learn at all, but there are a few things that you need to know. So look into that beforehand and get that skill under your belt pretty quickly if you can. Uh, just painting in general, you wouldn't think there's a lot to know about painting, but there really is. I highly suggest going on YouTube and looking up professional painters because what you think you know about different types of paint and about different styles of painting is almost certainly wrong unless you've been a professional painter or you're very close friends or family with a professional painter. Caulking, I tell you what, you're going to do a lot of caulking. I mean a lot. Every move out you do, every house you go to, it seems, there's going to be some amount of caulking involved. You can spend 30 minutes trying to caulk a countertop and do a horrible, ugly job of it and have no clue what you're doing. Or you can put in a little bit of time researching it and caulk out a whole kitchen in about six minutes. So that's going to be a skill. It's going to be a big one you're going to use a lot. Pressure washing, sometimes you can get away with just not offering any pressure washing services, but at the very least, you're going to be able to want to clear off people's garage floors and driveways. So look into the pressure washing. It is going to be a skill that you're probably going to want to have. Otherwise, like I said, they're going to have to send that to some other handyman, and now your client has two handymen, and they may end up liking the other one better, or he may be cheaper. You never know. But you want to keep your clients loyal to you, and you do that by taking care of all of their needs. Uh, snake and drains. Synonymous, synonymous with handyman, snake and drains. There are going to be clogged toilets, there's going to be clogged sinks, and you're going to need to use a snake to unclog those. And finally, basic electrical. And by basic electrical, I mean at the very least, you should be able to troubleshoot and replace faulty outlets and switches, and you should be able to install light fixtures and whatnot. You should be able to attach a new cord to your new garbage disposal that you're putting under the sink. None of this at all is super complicated. Basic electrical really is basic. Tons of YouTubers out there with really great info. I highly suggest you go watch them. So the next type of skill, those were all of the sort of the tools that you're going to need to learn to use and or the manual skills that you're going to need to learn to do on the job. But you're also going to need business skills. So here's what you'll need to be proficient at in order for your the business side of your business to be successful. You're going to need to be good at estimating labor and materials. And I do mean both, and you do need to be good at it because you're going to be giving a lot of estimates. And in order to give the estimate, you're going to have to be able to predict, even for jobs that you've never done before, you're going to have to be able to visualize these jobs and come up with a decent ballpark idea of how long it'll take you to do them. And you're not going to be great at it at first, but you do. it's going to be a steep learning curve, but you will need to get good at that, and you'll need to get good at it quickly. Uh, spotting possible complications. This is a business skill. You need to be able to look at a job and know. Uh, I'll give you a big example, although you won't be doing this much, but it's just a really good example. Is Let's say somebody wants you to remove a portion of a wall to open things up. What's behind that wall? You're going to need to know what's behind it, and one of the ways you can do that is going into the attic and looking for pipes and wires coming out of the wall, but you need to spot possible complications ahead of time because once you give that estimate and it gets approved, your client is expecting you to have looked everything over thoroughly and they're expecting you to have been able to predict what may or may not go wrong and either let them know in advance that if this happens, then we'll have to do this and the price will go up. Or at the very least, let them know in advance that there's no way for you to find out, but that they should be aware that it might happen and the price may change if it does happen. 
Another skill you're going to need is pricing. This is probably the most commonly asked question. On my YouTube channel, there are tons and tons of videos on pricing. We're not gonna dive deep into pricing here because this is about starting your handyman business rather than the long-term running of it, but I'm letting you know that one of the skills you'll need to get good at is pricing. And when you do pricing, there's a window. At the bottom end of this window and below, you're screwing yourself out of money. At the top of this window and above, you're gouging the client. But the window itself is a big window. You can charge very little without screwing yourself over. And you can charge a lot without gouging the client. But the goal is to get in that 75-80% area. You don't want to be anywhere in the bottom 50%. You want to be in that top 50%. And if you can get in the middle of that top 50%, you're going to find that you're making really good money without turning your clients off. But that's going to be a big skill you have to develop. Uh, a skill that's going to play heavily, heavily into your total revenue is the skill of scheduling. As a handyman, a lot of your jobs are going to be small, so you're going to be trying to knock out multiple jobs per day. That doesn't mean you won't be doing bigger jobs as well. But on those days where you're doing those small jobs, I do anywhere from three to six a day. That's a pretty average number for me. Three jobs in a day means I'm done a little after lunchtime. Six jobs in a day means I'm done at like 5.30. But the way to increase your revenue is to get very good at scheduling. And again, there are lots of videos on my YouTube channel that dive very deep into all the nuances of how to do that. But the short story for scheduling is that you don't need wasted time. So you need to predict when you're gonna leave the house, when you'll show up at the first job, how much time you need to do that job, how much time you need to drive to the next job, how much time you need to do that job, and you need to be able to fill in your day that, so that from the moment you leave to the moment you start driving home, all of that time is filled with billable hours. If you have gaps in there, that's all wasted time that you could have spent acquiring new customers, writing better estimates, doing more research, or otherwise improving your business. Another skill you're going to need, especially if you're working for property managers, is prioritizing jobs. Again, guys, if you're a handyman doing mostly smaller jobs, but lots of them, you're going to have jobs coming in every day, especially working for property managers. So every day there's jobs coming in and you have to be able to look at those jobs and say, ah, this is a leaky sink that's going to destroy the cabinet. This has to get bumped up on the list. I need to put that sooner. And then you need to be able to say, oh, this is a small hole in the back of a closet that needs to be patched and it's not hurting anybody that can go towards the end of the list. And then you take those unimportant ones going back to the scheduling and you find those gaps in your important job schedules to stick those into again, so that you're always billable, but you will need to be very good at prioritizing. Otherwise you're going to have really important jobs taking way too long while you're getting unimportant jobs done quickly. You'll need to be good at delegating and subcontracting. And what this means is if you do have people and resources that you can delegate and subcontract out to, you need to get good at knowing when you should do that and which job should go to which guy or which task should go to which employee. You'll always want to know. It's good to know what you're best at, and you do need to learn more and get better at all of these things. But if you have somebody who's outstanding as a painter, Maybe he's running his own business and you just kind of share jobs back and forth. If you have an outstanding painter who's super affordable and you have a lot of high priority important jobs over here and then somebody needs a whole house painted in a week, don't drop your important jobs and paint that house and put all them behind. Know that you have this painter guy over here that you can send that to. That's whether it's subcontracting or just giving him the job and letting him be the one to invoice it but know when to delegate and when to subcontract and what to delegate and what to subcontract. You're going to be, need to be very good at documentation and the reason this is a business skill is for documentation, guys. A lot of people, and it doesn't matter if you're a property manager or a homeowner, when people give you good money, if they don't feel like they got what they thought they were going to get, they're going to be upset and this can affect your business. And one of the ways to prevent people from being upset is by documenting 
everything very thoroughly and that does also include when you write your estimate including in your estimate all the different things that could go wrong or if you're going to patch drywall you might want to mention that you're going to match the texture as best you can but that there is no such thing as a perfect texture match then at the end if they're not happy with the texture match you as the handyman you do need to analyze your work and figure out if that's a valid concern they have but if you did the best texture match that most anybody would be able to do and it's just simply not perfect you've told them in advance that it's not perfect you want all of your communications whenever possible to be in writing that's part of the documentation as well as follow-ups you want to be following up on your estimates you want to be following up on your invoices and in general you want to just follow up with your clients to make sure that they're in full understanding of what the plan is what the pricing is what the expectations are Next is bookkeeping. Now, you can do this on your own if you want, but my recommendation is to get an accountant. I have an accountant. He has access to my jobber account. He has access to my bank account. He has access to everything in my business. I pay him money, and he takes accounting off of my plate, just like property managers pay me money, and I take maintenance off of their plate. I'm somebody who builds and maintains houses, not somebody who deals with the IRS. That's what accountants do, so I let them do that. I do suggest you get one, but if you don't, then I do suggest that you learn a lot about accounting and bookkeeping. Next is time management, and I tell you what, one of the biggest skills I had to learn with this business, especially while simultaneously raising identical twins, and my eight-year-old and my grown son who still needs a father you know we all need our parents all the time so between being a father a husband a business owner a youtuber and everything else that i do time management every minute you waste because time is money every minute you waste costs you money and holds your business back so get good at knowing what you should be putting your time into and then making sure that time is put in as efficiently and effectively as possible uh, asset allocation is going to be a big one unless you have unlimited resources you're going to have some amount of assets and assets can be tools assets can be materials and inventory assets can be a line of credit it can be time as an asset as well but you're going to need to know what all of your assets are and the goal is to utilize them in the most effective ways so that your business can grow as fast and solidly as possible you don't want to be dumping money into let's say let's say you have a good drill you've got a you've got a dewalt drill it's a hammer drill it's cordless small battery that you have to charge frequently but it all still works for you it hasn't messed you up yet and then you see the brand new milwaukee drill that costs 200 dollars more and it's super cool lightweight feels good in your hands sounds nice has a little more power don't put your assets into replacing a drill that's not broke unless you've done the math and figured out that this drill is going to save you x number of minutes times the amount of money you make per minute on the job and then you figured out that that's going to pay for itself in a month and a half and it's an investment that's fine but that's asset allocation is not putting your money into things where it doesn't need to go to and making sure that you do set the money aside for the things that it does need to go to uh, here's another big one could not have succeeded without it firing bad clients that's a business skill it's not easy to do guys i do understand that it was extremely hard for me the first time and the second time and the third time and it got easier over time but guys just like you don't want to have people in your life who suck value from your life rather than introducing value to your life you also can not have clients doing that so if you have clients I know you need money and I know you need jobs and I know you need to get paid and you got to do what you got to do to feed your family but you're gonna have to get good at firing bad clients because if you stay with them and you don't fire them you now have a bad business you can't have a good business with bad clients you will have to learn how to fire them plenty of information on my channel about that as well uh, here's a nice big one understanding your clients needs now I don't have any evidence of this I can't put any numbers to it but very early on I decided to specialize serving property managers I saw a lot of money just sitting there on the ground waiting to be picked up and all I had to do was go pick it up but to do that one of the things I needed to do to be able to pick that money up was I needed to figure out what my clients needs 
actually were. What Not just needs, but what their wants were. I had to understand the client. When they're looking for me and they find me, what are they hoping most I can do for them? So if you understand their needs, for example, my property managers, what they need is they're extremely busy all the time. They have tenants calling them nonstop. They have homeowners calling them nonstop. They've got tons of admin work that they have to do every day on the computer. They're very, very busy. What they don't want is to assign out a job to a handyman and then get a call from a tenant two days later saying, hey, I never heard anything from that handyman. Are we going to schedule this job? And then two days later, hey, the handyman finally scheduled, but he didn't show up this morning. Oh, wait a minute. Here he is. He's pulling in an hour late now. And then a call the next day saying, hey, the thing the handyman fixed doesn't work again already. He tightened up the thing on the door. Now the door doesn't work again. So understanding your client's needs, my client's needs, are for me to take maintenance off of their plate completely. We've gotten to a point where they now know they send me a work order electronically. I receive that work order, put it into my software, schedule the job, do the job, invoice the job. So from their perspective, they've sent me a work order, they've gone back to doing other things they need to do, and then all of a sudden they receive an invoice. And that's it. They don't know anything about their maintenance anymore because they don't need to. I took an entire chunk of their job off of their plate because I understood that that's what they needed. So understand what your client's needs are and make sure you're filling those needs better than your competition. And finally, incentivizing your clients. And an example that I can give you of that is I really love move outs. I like vacant properties with lots of work because I keep a good inventory and all of my tooling and I can be extremely efficient if I'm at one property with tons and tons of work. Those are the most profitable jobs for me. So what I did was I started prioritizing move outs, which typically I had about 10 days to finish. From the date assigned, they need to be completed within 10 days. And I used to complete them in five days, eight days, nine days, seven days, always on the latter end of that scale. When I decided I wanted more move outs, all I did was I started prioritizing them so that now I finish move outs typically within three or four days of being assigned, sometimes the next day if possible, but within three or four days. And what that does is it gives your property manager a lot of relief going, oh, oh, this is done and taken care of. I don't have to worry about whether he's going to finish it before those 10 days are up. I don't have to worry about anything. This is already done. Uh, I'll send the cleaners now and they can clean and we can just rent this thing right back out. So now you've made your property manager happy. She gets to go to the homeowner that she works for and say, hey, I got your property turned over even faster this time. Now we get a new tenant in, more rent money coming in. The homeowner's happier, the property manager's happier, I'm happier. And the end result is I've become the move out guy. It feels like I just get all the move outs now. And that's because I incentivized my clients to send me more move outs. And then last but not least, guys, interpersonal and communication skills. These are going to be necessary. These are not something, they're not something that once you get good at them, you see a dramatic increase in revenue. What these are is more of an insurance plan. These are things that if you don't get good at them, they are a landmine waiting to go off. So the first one is articulate and precise verbal and written communication. This won't matter most of the time. If they say, please change the smoke detectors, you can go change the smoke detectors, send an invoice and say, installed five new smoke detectors. Not much is going to go wrong there, right? But let's say you need to rebuild a deck, right? And the homeowner has certain expectations in their minds from the estimate they approved as to what that's going to look like and feel like when it's all said and done. Same thing with the property manager. So if you're not precise with your both verbal and written communication, they could be expecting something different than what you deliver. And I've kind of touched on this a little bit in some of these other ones, but it's very important to understand that even though most of the time it won't matter, there will come a time when your client is assuming something and the reason they're assuming it is because you weren't clear with your communication about what is 
and is not included in this estimate or when you're going to do it or how long it's going to take to do it or whether or not you're going to be committing every single full work day for three days to get it done or whether you're going to be doing half days while knocking out smaller jobs on each of those days. All of those things matter. So you will, as far as interpersonal skills and communication, you're going to need to be good at setting expectations and communicating that. Uh, saying no is another one. Uh, this is also a business skill, but saying no is an interpersonal skill because you don't just say no. You need to be able to say no in a way that makes them feel good. For example, a phrase that I've used before is, I don't believe that my company can price this competitively, so we suggest that you hire an independent specialist to do this because their pricing is going to be more in line with the market value. That's a good way to say no. A bad way to say no is, I'm not very good at this and I don't think I can make any money off it unless I charge you too much. Both of those statements mean the same thing. But on one hand, you said, I'm not good and I'm going to charge you too much money. And on the other hand, you're just more apologizing and saying, I'm sorry, but I don't feel like my business is able to price this effectively. And we want you to get good quality, effective pricing. And here's how you can go and do that. Those are both the same statement and they mean very, very different things. Next is uh, not taking things personally. This is another big one, guys, because there will come a day. You know, people, people in this world have all kinds of problems and issues going on that we don't know about. Everybody's going through their own struggles. And some people are just not good people. But there will come a day when you have a tenant or a client who just doesn't want to be happy. They can't be happy. They're not in the mood to be happy. They enjoy complaining. They enjoy bringing other people down. And they will find a problem with you. And that problem is not going to be a real problem. And you're going to know it's not a real problem. They're going to say, you didn't communicate effectively. Or they're going to say, they're not going to be home when you show up for the appointment. And you're going to say, hey, I have to charge a missed trip fee because we had this appointment and you weren't here. And they're going to say, you never confirmed the appointment. And then you're going to go back through your text messages and you're going to see where you said, I can show up Wednesday at 3 p.m. And they said, or you said, I can show up on this day at this time. And then they said, yeah, that sounds great. And then you said, thanks, right? And to you, that was confirmed. And to me and you and everybody else who reads that text string, they would agree that that appointment was confirmed. But they're going to say, no, but you didn't specifically say appointment. They're just going to be bad people, right? They're going to complain and they're going to give you a hard time. And in your personal life, you can react however you want. But in your professional life, you're going to need to understand that if you play into their game, if, if you take what they say to you personally and you start getting into a verbal altercation with them, now if that's a homeowner client and you just don't want them as a client anymore, it's fine. They're going to go on Google and leave bad reviews. Maybe you can afford that, maybe you can't. But if you're doing business to business like me, you can't have tenants calling property managers and making their lives harder because they need to complain about you because of whatever it is they claim that you did or didn't do. So don't take things personally and just understand that you're going to have some clients who aren't nice and all you need to do guys is blow off whatever they're saying and just repeat, you know, if you're trying to schedule and they're claiming that you're not communicating effectively with them with scheduling, just repeat yourself. Just say, well, ma'am, you know, once again, I'm just letting you know next Wednesday for arrival at 3 p.m. is my next available time that I can show up to do this job. So if you would like that slot, please let me know. The next available time after that is it just you can keep repeating yourself and don't get upset and understand they may be going through something or they may just not be good people. But how they feel and how they speak to you doesn't actually affect you and your business. Just get the business done and don't take it personally. And also under interpersonal skills is going to be behaving and speaking like a business and not a person. This one is not super hard to do. All it takes is a little practice, but you need to always remember, you know, we were talking about in the previous episode about what a handyman is. Your goal with this business is not to be a handyman. Your goal is to be a handyman business, and a business speaks and behaves differently than a person. A handyman is a person 
that has feelings and things going on in their life. They may talk to you about personal things. They may use certain language around you because they're a person and you're a person and you're just two people. But it's going to be important that you learn to start speaking and behaving like a business would. And if you need to know what that means, rather than me giving you eight examples, imagine that you call the cable company and they need to send a cable installer out. The way you're going to talk to that person on the phone or the way you expect them to talk to you, got some kind of little gnat in here, the way you expect that person to be talking to you is the way that you should be talking to your tenants and your clients. And the same thing when the guy shows up to work on the cable. When he shows up, you expect him to be dressed a certain way. You expect him to be groomed. You expect him to introduce himself and say what he's there for. Just think of the interaction you would want with a service provider from a legit business and start acting that way. Another thing you can do is start using terms like we instead of I, uh, a business typically goes by we, and it's not to lie and pretend like you have eight employees. It's just a business is a, is a collection. It's a collection of you, the people in your life who support you, the subcontractors that you may or may not send out on jobs, uh, your wife or somebody else who sometimes helps you with admin work, your accountant, all the people involved in the business make a collective we. So when you speak, you should say we we will make sure that this job is done by Saturday like you requested. We noticed that there was also some rotten fascia on the house. And it's, it's, it's not that it's not okay to say I. It will just be good for you to learn to start saying we and to start looking at yourself if you are an owner-operator. Try to start looking at yourself as the collective business rather than as you as a person. And then try to behave and speak as such. And then finally, guys, I think the most important skill you're going to need, this is the skill that will make or break your business 100%. It will be the difference between you skyrocketing to the top or crashing to the bottom is self-imposed discipline and integrity. You're going to be working independently quite frequently. You're going to know how you could cheat, how you could hack things. You're going to know what you can and can't get away with. To the extent that you choose to cheat and hack and get away with things, you may get away with them for a while, but not forever. And there is no faster way to get yourself marked off of somebody's list than to be caught lying, cheating, or otherwise just not having integrity, not being honest, and not having discipline. This means, you know, when you've scheduled out two full weeks of work, every single day for two full weeks and you need to be leaving the house by 7 a.m. every day for two weeks. That self-imposed discipline means even though you're not going to get fired for sleeping in and missing a couple jobs, even though that one mistake by itself one time isn't going to ruin your business, making yourself do that every day without fail over the course of six months your property managers or your realtors or your other clients, they will notice over the course of six months that they just never have received a complaint about you, at least not a legitimate one. They will notice that you seem to be the one and only handyman they've ever met who truly has things under control. And what's going to happen is they're going to have some more high value homeowners that have more expensive properties, that need more expensive work done, or that are just more picky, but that don't mind paying more. And when those high value ones come along, when the really important jobs come along, and those important ones are the ones you can charge that premium on, you're the go-to guy, because you're known to be the one who has never dropped the ball, or if you have, you've dropped the ball twice in a year, rather than 17 times in a year or three times every single month. So guys, these are all the skills. As I said at the beginning, uh, this is not an exhaustive list. You need so many more skills than this. You don't have to be perfect at all of them in order to start your handyman business. But these are, in my opinion, 
the necessary skills for starting and running a handyman business. And if you have these down, you're golden forever. Your clients will be extremely happy with you. You will get referred out more and more and you will have no problem. Your biggest problem will be so many clients and so much work that you can't keep up. And now you have to figure out how to hire some people just to keep up with the volume. I do promise you that, but this is the list of skills. Thank you all for coming, and I'll see you on the next episode, which is going to be about the multiple different business models that you can run your handyman business by.